Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kulshreshtha. It's One Place Sports' honor to be broadcasting this international webinar all across the world. Working out, training hard, of course is required, but it's not enough. Relaxation is absolutely essential. Our experience and expertise to help set up Olympic Studies centers based at the university level in India. Greetings to India from beautiful Germany. Thank you very much, Dr. Saman. Namaste to everybody. Greetings to India. My name is Uri Rosen. I'll be very glad to host this lecture at this time now. So, before I start my presentation, I want to give you something to think about. When you think about Olympic athletes or Olympic medalists, you see superstars. And they are. If you win an Olympic gold medal, you are a superstar in your sport. But 98, 99% of all Olympic medalists cannot live from their sport after they finish the sport. So if you peak in your sports career at say 25, 26, 28, afterwards you go back to normal life. The number of people who actually make real big money from the sport is very limited. It's like 1% of all the athletes. Of course, Usain Bolt is a millionaire, but the other 99% are not. If you finish number five after Usain Bolt, nobody even knows your name, but still you're a superstar athlete. So the interesting thing is that there are studies showing that former Olympic athletes are much more successful in life after their sports career than you and me and normal people. So Olympic athletes are more successful in life than normal people, which means that there must be something. There must be something they know or they do or they can that we can't that makes them successful. And so my question for my presentation today is, what can we learn from Olympic medalists? And I will now share my screen and start my presentation. I hope that you can see that and that this technically works out. Please let me know if you can see my presentation. Here we have lessons learned from Olympic medalists. I hope that the technology is broadcasting. I hope that you can see me. Before I start answering that question, let me very briefly introduce myself and who I am and what I do. This is my office actually. Uh, the Reinhard Mohn Professional College in Germany is a leading institution in its field. We have more than 120 years of excellence and are 25 plus years number one in Germany. And uh, we are teaching roughly 2,000 undergraduate, undergraduate students in health sciences. So we are a pretty large so institution. We are term very uh, successful. Very are successful. In, in this college, I turned this college and I have some professional interests which are mainly around psychoneuroendocrinology and immunology. I'm a brain scientist by training, I'm a neuroscientist by training, uh, and I'm very interested also in the field of epigenetics and nutrition, and I care a lot about high performance training. So my own sports career is like three decades in Chinese martial arts. I've participated in a number of world championships uh, and hold the seventh Yuan graduation, which is the largest or the highest graduation outside of China and currently serve as the national coach for Germany. Here in our Olympic movement, uh, I'm involved since roughly 1990 when I first visited the International Olympic Academy and I have been coming back like every second year since I have long record of working for the German National Olympic Committee and I have practically co-authored all educational material of the German NOC. So when you see books or brochures or videos or websites about Olympic education in Germany, uh, I kind of had my hands in this. So, um, I know that you are, of course, in the field and much familiar with the term Olympism. Just to bring us all to the very same point, I would like to roughly make a very quick detour for the question of 
what Olympism is. And well, you know what Olympism is. We have the Olympic Charter and it says Olympism is a philosophy of life, exciting for mind and balanced whole, the quality of the body with the mind, blending sports with culture education. Olympism seeks straight away of life based on the joy of effort, and dedication value of good examples, social responsibility and respect for universal fundamental ethical principles. And to go on, the goal of Olympism is to play sport as a service of the harmonious development of mankind with a view to promoting a peaceful society concerned with the preservation of human dignity. And I must say, I love this sentence. I absolutely love this sentence from the Olympic Charter. It is my favorite sentence from the 100 or so pages of the Olympic Charter because it is so dense with wisdom and with things. I would like to highlight two things here. The one thing is, Olympism is not a sport. Olympism is a philosophy of life, a way of life, a lifestyle. That's what Olympism is. And this lifestyle is very closely related to values. And these values have educational quality. So sport is not what the Olympic movement is about. The Olympic movement is about installing a way of life based on values. Sport is a servant, is a tool which we use to bring out these values and develop the values. But this is what Olympism is about. It's a philosophy of life based on values, as Pierre Cretin himself says. And here you see um, that this is the reason why we talk about Olympic education, because that's what Olympism is. Olympic education is at the heart of Olympism because it's a lifestyle based in value. And these values are excellence, respect, friendship. These are the three main major core values the IOC has selected. And when you have a look at educational activities, they are usually rounded around the five big Olympic educational themes. This is joy of effort, a term already found in the charter. So we like uh, being afforded and we find joy in that, but also we play fair and we respect ourselves and others. Uh, we pursue excellence. It's not about winning. It's about giving your best and pursuing excellence. It's not about winning, it's pursuing excellence. And all in all, to live a harmonious and balanced life. So we have a holistic approach here um, in a combination of body, mind and will. So since we are now talking about the question how we can develop Olympic education, we must ask ourselves, well, who actually teaches these values? Well, the answer is very simple. Everybody, everybody teaches these values. Mothers and fathers teach these values. Family members teach these values. Teachers from kindergarten to university teach these values. Society, politicians, everybody teaches these values. But Olympic athletes are not only also teachers of these values, they are the most important teachers of these values. Why? Well, because they are so incredibly visible. They are not the most important teachers because they are more important. No, they're not. But they are so much more visible. Imagine Olympic Games, Summer Games, track and field, 100 meter sprint, Man's finale, Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt is running for gold with 100 meters. Two billion people are watching. Can you imagine this? Two billion people are watching Usain Bolt running. But not only do people watch him running, they also see what Usain Bolt is doing after running. Is he shaking hands with his opponents or is he arrogantly looking down on the other losers so what is his behavior and through this through this extreme visibility olympians are the true 
torchbearers of this lifestyle. Olympism, Olympic athletes have the highest teaching amount in this question because they are so incredible, value, visible. And so people look up to these people. Yeah, we are the human. We all need heroes. We all need heroes in our lives. We need people to look up to. We need orientation. We need leadership. And so people look at these Olympic athletes and ask themselves, what kind of life does this person lead? What kind of food does Usain Bolt eat? What kind of lifestyle does he have? And now I want to invite you together with me to have a look at the inside of the lifestyle of Olympic athletes. Have a look at Olympians road to success. Well, I have identified seven lifestyle choices or seven lifestyle factors that Olympic athletes all have. No matter the discipline, no matter where they're from, every Olympic medalist has the same seven lifestyle choices. The first is purpose. You know, in a world where you can go any way in any direction, Olympic athletes only go one way. They have one goal, they want one thing and one thing only, and this one thing, winning in the games, gives their life purpose and sense and meaning. They feel their life is meaningful because it has purpose, it has sense, it has meaning, it has direction and one direction only. Lifestyle choice number two, through this purpose and this dedication comes community. Remember your family. You want to become this, but your mama says, no, you should become that. Your papa says, you should become that. Your uncle has a different opinion. The teacher has an next opinion. Everybody has a different opinion. But if you are an Olympic athlete, you live in a community of people where everybody sits in the same boat. You want to win at the games. The trainer wants you to win at the game. The physiotherapist wants you to win. The doctor wants you to win. The teammates wants to win. Everybody wants the same thing. And when you train so hard and so much, you are only surrounded by like-minded people. You only have friends who are like you because you don't have time for the others, right? You don't have time for other people who are not in your community. And so an Olympic athlete lives in a purpose-driven community and that makes a big difference. And out of this community comes a very positive mindset. In sports psychology, there are two groups of people. Some work out because they fear failure and some work out because they hope for success. And whereas it is possible to be an okay athlete or a good athlete, while you work out fearing failure, you can only be a top class, world class athlete if you have a positive mindset. This means that you expect positive things and that you hope for a positive outcome and this motivates you to train. So these three things, purpose, community and positivity, these are the first three lifestyle choices of Olympic athletes. And these three are immensely important because Every study on health, happiness, longevity shows that these three are essential to what we call subjective well-being. So if you feel happy or not, this depends on these three. And if your life lacks these three, then your life is dominated by chronic stress. 
Chronic stress is induced through permanently elevated levels of cortisol, the leading stress hormone, and permanent overactivation of the sympathetic nervous system. And these levels of cortisol and the permanent overactivation is very dangerous because chronic stress has massive negative content. This means that people who have a high level of purpose community positivity at the same time have a low level of chronic stress and vice versa if people have low purpose low community low positivity then people have a high level of chronic stress and i will explain later why chronic stress is so dangerous and has so many negative consequences okay these were the first three lifestyle choices of olympians let's move on number four well that's obvious working out training exercising if you ask people on the street hey what do you think what is the main thing olympic athletes do well people will say wait i guess they are training a lot and that's right they work out a lot usually professional athletes train three times a day that's massive okay that's clear but one thing that most people do not understand is that working out, training hard, of course is required, but it's not enough. Number five, and this might surprise you, relaxation. Relaxation is absolutely essential because it repairs the destruction produced through training. So, just to give you a specific example, in our national team, when we prepare for the World Championship, we practice with our national team athletes, we practice roughly two hours per day relaxation technique. Not sleeping, relaxation technique. Two hours a day. And there you can see how important that is. And number six is equally important, it's sleep. All studies about Western lifestyle or the lifestyle of people in Western industrialized countries show that people sleep shorter and shorter time in less and less quality. People don't sleep enough and people don't sleep well enough. This is another part of regeneration. Um, if people do not sleep enough, they don't regenerate. And that's why we care with all our athletes very much about sleep. Let me summarize these three for you and show you what that means. We have exercise, relaxation, sleep. These three stimulate the body's so-called relaxation response. In brain science, we call this the neurovegetative downregulation through parasympathetic nervous system. So this body's relaxation response is induced through the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. And this is very important because this relaxation response is the body's counterbearing of the cortisol-induced sympathetic stress response. So you have always a balance here. You have workout, you have stress, and then you have relaxation. You have input and you have repair. And this relaxation is absolutely essential. Many people underestimate the relaxation, but in training, the body suffers from destruction. So it needs relaxation and sleep in order to be repaired. If you don't give enough time to the repair body mechanism of the body, then you will suffer. So what you have is a permanent cycle. You have life events, which is an Olympic athlete's uh, competition and training. These life events trigger the stress response, and then you need the relaxation response to get ready for new life events. And why is this so incredibly important? Why is the balance of stress response and relaxation response so important? Well, it is so important because it has genetic influence. This means that the balance of stress and relaxation changes your gene code. 
Everything you are, you are through your genes and with your genes. And the balance of stress and relaxation changes your genes. And this is a very, very important point. And in order to understand this point better and how genetics work, to understand that better, I would like to invite you to follow me on a very short tour through genetics. This is a little bit like uh, 11th grade high school uh, biology class. I will make this very quick and you might um, remember some things <coughs> from school. So genetics is a study of genes and we try to explain what a gene is and how a gene works. And genes are how living organisms inherit features and pass information down through generations and generations. How does that look like? Well, you might remember this. This is a standard body cell. You see the orange part, that's the powerhouse of the cell, the mitochondria. You see the ribosomes, lysosome, and all that. And you see the big pinkish ball in the middle, that is the nucleus of the cell. And you see little black dots in that nucleus. Well, you might remember these are the chromosomes. Here you have the chromosomes under a microscope and then you can sort them and you can enlarge them. And you have, might have heard that humans have 23 or respectively 46 chromosomes, like 23 from the mom, 23 from the dad. And here you are, that is your chromosome set. And if you look at one of the chromosomes, it has typically this X-shaped figure. And you see that the surface of that chromosome is uh, bumpy and not even and not smooth. What is that? Well, this has to do with what the chromosome is composed of. On the right side here you have the DNA string. This DNA string in your body is thousands of kilometers long, but you are not thousands of kilometers long. So the DNA string is too long, so it has to be compacted into a uh, a better format and you can see that the DNA string from right to left it coils around these pinkish balls these balls are histones that are proteins and the DNA string coils around these balls and then coiled together to strings and then super coiled together to larger strings and then on the left top side form the X-shaped bubbly chromosome and this is the DNA double helix. Uh, on the outside, it has the transport structure of the double helix. And in the inside, it has the base pairs, which carry the actual genetic information. If you look deeper with a microscope, uh, you see the molecular structure. And here you see the greenish balls who are the actual genetic information, the base pairs, and the bluish molecules, the bluish balls here, that are the holding and the transport structure of the DNA double helix. Well, that was roughly 10th grade biology genetics, but you have to understand, if you talk about genetics, that genes are not made of concrete or not made of marble. Genes are not Forever, genes are not computer programs, and only 10% of our genes are fixed, like eye color, hair color, skin color. If you have brown eyes, then you have brown eyes, and that's it. You can't do anything about it. Whatever you do or don't do, you have brown eyes and you have to live with it. These are the 10% of your genes that are fixed, which means that 90% of your genes are actually not fixed. That means you have these genes, but it's not decided yet if they play out or don't. So how does that work? What about the other 90%? Well, a gene has a switch, much like a lamp has a switch, right? If you have a lamp, the lamp has a switch. If you switch it on, then the light shines light. And if you switch it off, you don't have light. And the same is here. If a switch on a gene is turned on, 
when the gene is, we say, expressed. The gene reproduces itself. But if the switch is off, then the gene is ignored. So a question we get a lot is, do I have a gene for this and that? For example, if you think about diseases, do I have a gene for obesity, for diabetes, for heart attack, for cancer? Well, the answer is always yes. You know, and this is very important to understand, it is not the way that some people have genes for cancer and other people don't have genes for cancer. That's not like that. Everybody of you has genes for cancer. Everybody of you has genes for heart disease, for diabetes, for whatever. Everybody of you has the genes. The question is not if you have the genes or not, because you do have the genes. The question is, is the switch on or is the switch off? So the question is not, do I have a gene for cancer? Yes, you have. The question is, is the switch on or is the switch off? And the science that studies these switches is called epigenetics, how and why genes are switched on and off. And that is what highly interests me. You can imagine it like this. Here you have a chromosome and there's a red switch on it, where which you can switch the gene on and off. Of course, this is just a silly image, but you remember this? molecular structure I just showed you before and you see the bluish balls on the DNA double helix well if you look deeper then you have this right you see that on top of the base pair is this green ball and that is the switch and you can imagine like this imagine you are a family father and now you need a paper, a certificate from your city administration, from the municipality. So you go to the big administration building, to the municipality, and you want to go to the office where you can get your paper. And the office is there, but at the entrance of the administration building, there is a doorkeeper, a bouncer, if he lets you in, then you can go to the office and have your paper. And if, you, if he says no and he does not let you in, then you don't get your paper. So the office is still there, but you can't go there because you cannot enter the building. And that's how it is. You have a gene, but the question is, is the switch on or off? And that is what epigenetics does. Epigenetics studies these switches on the genes especially for uh, so-called heritable phenotypes. So no alteration in the DNA sequence is involved. It's all about what you have already and how it is switched on and off. The word already says that genetics is the study of genes and epi means like in addition to. So epigenetics is what we have in addition to traditional genetics. So the very interesting question is, how do you switch the gene on or off, right? If you have all the genes for everything, how do you switch it on or off? Or to come back to the example of our athlete, you have, everybody of you has the same genetic code, like 99.999%, same genetic code like an Olympic athlete, but still you are not an Olympic athlete. So what has happened? You have the same genes. Why are you and we so different? Well, this is because although we have and share the same genes, some switches are on and some are off. And we are different in this. So how do you switch a gene on or off? Well, first we have, of course, environmental factors like radiation. For example, sunlight can give you cancer. Cell phones can give you cancer, radioactivity can give you cancer, and so on. Then, of course, poison and pollution. That's why it's so important for a country to have clean air, clean water, clean soil, clean food, because the pollution in the air and the water will switch genes, and then these genes make you sick. And, of course, you can change 
the switches with drugs and medication. That's, for example, why medicine works and that's why doping is so popular. But back to my topic, we were talking about lifestyle factors or lifestyle choices. And now let's take the first three. The first three lifestyle choices I presented were these. Purpose, community, positivity. So, purpose, community, positivity result in a higher or lower stress response in the body. More or less cortisol, adrenaline, noradrenaline in the body. More or less chronic stress. And chronic stress has the ugly feature that it switches genes on or off. So chronic stress, for example, switches cancer genes on. Whereas the other three, exercise, relaxation, sleep, result in a high or low relaxation response. So high or low level of parasympathetic nervous system activation and this relaxation response switches genes on and off. So the interaction of stress hormones and relaxation response switch tens of thousands of genes on and off. The human body has well, science is actually not fully clear on this question. Uh, the, the current actual opinion in the science community is that humans roughly have 25,000 genes. And the balance of stress response, relaxation response is able to trigger the switches of approximately 15 to 18,000 of them. So these lifestyle factors have enormous results. If you listened carefully before, you might remember I said there are seven lifestyle choices, right? Not six, seven. I only presented six so far because I wanted to present the seventh lifestyle factor in the end. Why? Because it's the most important one. Stress response, very important. Relaxation response, super important. But the seventh lifestyle choice all Olympic athletes make is the most important lifestyle choice at all. Why? Because it has the most power to switch genes on and off. And this seventh lifestyle choice, this enormous and most powerful lifestyle choice is nutrition. It's your diet. It's what you eat and what you drink. Here you have it, number seven, nutrition. So, are you interested in having a look what athletes actually eat? What do the most successful Olympic athletes actually eat? Are you willing to have a look with me? I hope so, because I love to present this, because this is my most favorite part. And the interesting thing is that through all the history, through all the history of the modern Olympic Games, successful athletes every time eat the same thing. Let me walk you very, very quickly through the last 100 years of Olympic eating. 100 years ago, 1924, Olympic Games, Pavo Nomi, the greatest runner of all times, nine Olympic gold medals. 20, 40 years later, Murray Rose, a legendary Australian swimmer, 15 world records, four Olympic gold medals. Wow. <clears throat> Edwin Moses, Olympic gold medalist, four world records. Or Carl Lewis, the hero of my childhood, track and field, nine Olympic gold medals. What a hero. Let's switch to winter sport. From Russia, Alexei Voivoda in bobsled, Megan Dermel, figure skating, Hannah Tether, Olympic gold medalist, snowboard, and to the right, oh my God, Bodie Miller. This man has, I don't know, like more gold medals than I have teeth in my mouth. He's a legendary alpine skier. Back to power sports, Kendrick Ferris, American Olympian weightlifter, Tia Blanco, surfing, 
Serena and Venus Williams, wow, tennis legends. Dusty Balch, cycling, David Hay, boxing, Olympic boxing. From here, let's make a little detour through non-Olympic sports because this nutrition thing does not only um, cover Olympic sports, it covers every elite sport. Nate Diaz, mixed martial arts, Patrick Babumian, the strongest man in the world, Baron Duplessis, world champion bodybuilder, Mr. Universe 2014, Scott Urek, most legendary ultra marathon runner neil robertson this man has in snooker more medals in his closet than i have closes in my closet and Lionel messi most successful football player in the world and on the right lewis hamilton five times world champion in formula one and greetings from the proud motherland india mr sushil kumar Bronze medal Olympic Games 2008, world champion wrestling 2010, silver medalist Olympic Games 2012. Woo! Wow! So, we have old and young, men and women, summer sports, winter sports, power sports, speed sports, endurance sports, concentration sports. We have all types of sports from all disciplines and people from all walks of life. And still, their nutrition is the same. All these athletes for the last hundred years and thousands of medals, they all have the same nutrition. Well, look closely. All of these athletes, and of course, many, many, many more, they are all vegan. Yes, they are all vegan. And the more performance, the more vegan. So an athlete on a lower level of performance may eat what he wants, but the closer you come to a gold medal, the more and more people are actually vegan. So let me very, very briefly make the case for a plant-based diet. Well, animal protein actually is a burden for the body. It makes the blood tick, it stiffens the arteries and it stresses digestion. Um, that's simply not good enough. We can eat animal protein. Yes, we can do that and we can digest that. But well, it makes us slow, it makes us weak, it blocks regeneration and it basically makes us unhappy. And you know, for you and me, people from everyday life, if we are slow and weak, okay. But if you are an Olympic athlete, you don't want to be slow, you want to be fast, you don't want to be weak, you want to be strong, you must have regeneration. So, whereas we as humans, we are technically able to digest animal protein, but well, it's simply not good for us. We are better off without. So what is the nutrition of Olympic athletes and what should your nutrition be like? Well, the most important thing is the few animal protein, the better, better is no animal protein, no meat. Doesn't matter what kind of meat, no meat. No fish, no seafood, no dairy, no cheese, no milk. This is all animal products, don't eat them. What should you eat instead? Plants, 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 any type of leafy plants, any type of pulses, nuts, seeds, roots, fruits, and so on. Also good, whole grain carbohydrates, superfoods like turmeric or ginger, but importantly, no industry food, especially no sugar and no refined or processed food. Why? Is your nutrition so important? Well, you remember this uh, slide which we had before? Well, nutrition is so important because it has the power to switch the genes on or off. So that's why it is. You want to have good nutrition because you want to have certain genes switch on and certain other genes switch off. And that is why this is so important. So, when we research Olympic athletes, we find seven lifestyle factors. The first three create a low stress response, the second three create a high relaxation response, and the seventh one nutrition is the most important because this directly switches thousands of genes on and off.
Wow, that was an intense ride. Let's circle back to where we started. Where did we start? Okay, we said that Olympism is a lifestyle. It's a value-based lifestyle. These values were excellence, respect, and friendship. Okay. And we said that Olympians are the most prominent and the most visible teachers of these values and they teach the values through their lifestyle. If you see an Olympic gold medalist eating plants, you ask yourself, why is this man or this woman eating plants? I always thought meat makes you strong. I always thought you need meat for your muscles. I always thought milk is healthy. And look at this woman. She has five Olympic gold medals and she doesn't drink milk. And she doesn't eat meat. And she does not eat fish. She is faster than everybody else. What's going on? How can that happen? Yeah, Olympians teach these values through their lifestyle. And the lifestyles, we said, are purpose, community, positivity, producing a low stress response. And exercise, relaxation, sleep, producing a high relaxation response. And finally, nutrition, producing most positive epigenetic changes. So what, in order to answer my initial question, what actually can we learn from an Olympian? Well, live like an Olympian. That's a good thing to do. Live like an Olympian. Excellence, respect, friendship. You might say, wow, that is difficult. That is complicated. How can I do that? Well, choose the of the seven as a starting point. Choose purpose. Care about meaning and sense and purpose in what you do. Care about your community. Surround yourself with people who are like you and have the same purpose. Circle around positivity. Expect success, hope your failure, develop a positive mindset. Exercise, work out, at rest daily. Care for relaxation, care for your sleep, and the most important thing, whole grain, plant-based diet, don't kill animals. I know that most of you, being Indians, will intuitively understand this. You have a 5,000-year-old history of ahimsa, not harming, um, this is basically this. And what Pierre de Coubertin says about respect for oneself and for others, this also includes other sentient, intelligent and emotional beings, meaning animals. So, these are the things that we learn from the athletes. And this is my uh, idea of how you can become a little bit also like an Olympic athlete. If you practice no matter how big or small, every step counts. If you practice the lifestyle of an Olympic athlete, you will become a member of a better life. Thank you very much. By the way, after this presentation, I will send the organizers a copy of my presentation. Otherwise, please be free to contact me and uh, with questions or ideas. I'm very happy to hear from you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a wonderful session and very informative too, uh, that in a very short time you have covered so so many important topics like chronic stress, relaxation, sleep, nutrition, genetics. It, it is, it is in, uh, amazing. So I appreciate uh, the way you presented this. Uh, so I have a question uh, that that will be concerned of most of the participants also so i want to ask that uh, you know uh, these days sports has become so competitive and players they have tournaments or competition one after another and they have very less time for recovery and relaxation and that if they don't get uh, proper recovery and relaxation they, that ultimately leads to injury and what you talked about the chronic stress so uh, what are the specific and latest uh, strategies that uh, the olympic athletes are using these days uh, to get out of such situation that is my question to you. yeah Please. that is a very very good question thank you very much 
and it's absolutely true. Uh, just to explain an example from, let's say, one of the most popular sports in the world, basketball. If you think about the American basketball, the NBA, the players train on every weekday three times and on the weekend they fly all across the country for the competition and they have the regular season. After that, if they are successful, they have the conference playoffs and then if they are successful, they have the real playoffs and then the next start, season starts again. This is a, you're absolutely right, this is a complete grind to the body and the mind. Um, well, the strategy is education. For example, national teams or national centers, they, they hire, they engage with me or my, my, my team and we teach them to take more stress out and put more relaxation in. For example, um, like 20, 30 years ago, trainers would always have said, okay, more training, harder training, go harder. Today, people have learned through our work, for example, that relaxation is equally important. So as I said before, in our national team, we do two hours of relaxation exercises each day. So basically it comes down to education. We educate athletes, we educate trainers, we educate Olympic training centers, national training centers to incorporate more relaxation uh, techniques into the training process. It's about knowledge, it's about education. Good afternoon everyone. I'm Dr. Ekta Bhushan Satkandi from mm -hmm. uh, Indra Gandhi Institute of Physical Education and Sports Sciences, Delhi University. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank and congratulate for the wonderful session, uh, Professor Ulrich. Um, my question is, um, uh, as we can see that uh, this is so important, the Olympic ed education is so important for overall development of an individual, how we can inculcate at really grassroots level or at school, school level? Well, um, this is a top-down process. It's a top-down process. If you think about school, you know, a school teacher cannot do whatever he wants. He has a curriculum. So the teacher does what the curriculum says. So if you want to incorporate Olympic education in the school, you must change the curriculum. Who writes the curriculum? People who have the order to write them from the government. So you need to talk to the government, the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Sport, Ministry of Health and so on. So to my understanding, this is a top-down process. You need to speak to the politicians, they will give the orders to the curriculum makers, and the curriculum goes to school and the teachers do what is written in there. If Olympic education is in the curriculum, we'll have that, if not, then not. Other than, other than um, adding to the curriculum, what else you can do? I would say not much, because again, school is not free, a teacher is not free. Mm -hmm. What happens in, let's say, math or a history class is what the curriculum says. If you want something different in math or history or biology, you need to put it in the curriculum, that's it. Education, from my understanding as German, education is a hierarchical process, right? There is no, you know, in politics, you have a top-down process and also a grassroots NGOs, you have a up-down process, up, uh, down-upwards process. In education, I would say you don't have that. Uh, education is a hierarchical process if you want to change the subjects, you must change the curriculum. That's how I would see that. Hello, good morning. I think that hey, congratulations for your speech. Very, very, really nice. Um, I think that it's it's from my point of view when we talk about education, it's very important to to promote, uh, for instance, physical education based in scientific evidences. That means that is we need we need to see what's happening in the real class of a physical education, and then to try to give very practical tools, very pragmatical tools 
to the teachers because education is a core action. So what do you think about this this short of of connection between the research, the real, the real and practical research and the physical education? Do you have any any experience? Do you know some colleagues that are working in this very pragmatical and applied point of view? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I hope that most schools and colleges work like that, right? The, what you have in the curriculum is somehow based on scientific findings. For example, when I recommend a certain way of nutrition, and we always also teach that in health science class, when we recommend certain nutrition, these recommendations are, of course, based in fundamental scientific research. Or when we recommend daily exercise or relaxation, we can prove through scientific research, like epigenetic research, for example, that this is so, as we say, and that this works. So, yeah, I hope that, well, at least in, in my community, we would say that everything that we teach is based on scientific findings. Yeah, 